Hi everyone, I am Fabian from the National Museum of Singapore and today we have a very special program uh, in celebration of the museum's ethnic festival celebrations as part of Deepa Valley. So for today's uh, program, we are actually going to talk a bit more about spices. As you know, spices are regularly used to cook um, Deepa Valley dishes and also other types of dishes in Singapore. Not many people will know that actually spices are closely associated with Ayurveda. Okay? For those of you who are not familiar with Ayurveda, it is a traditional healing system that originated from India. And today we have the pleasure of having uh, Vasanti from the Ayurveda Association of Singapore who will be able to share with us a bit more about this topic. Hi everyone, my name is Vasanti Pillay. I'm the president of the Ayurveda Association of Singapore. Now, I do not come from a family tradition of Ayurveda physician. However, how I got involved in Ayurveda was I used to suffer a lot from gastritis pain. And I remember when I was 15 years old, once my grandmother came to visit me and she noticed that I was um, suffering a lot. And she came up with a very interesting concoction of a porridge. And just like that, my pain disappeared. And that was, I would say, my very first experience, exposure to Ayurveda per se. Now, I come from third generation Singapore, and my parents, uh, my mother used to practice Ayurveda as what we would call folk medicine or kitchen pharmacy. So, what they do is they go to the kitchen anytime we have any pain or whatever, they just go to the kitchen, take all these herbs and all those because all of them have medicinal properties. So, as a kid, I was exposed in that sense, food as medicine. So that's how I got to know about Ayurveda. But formally in 1995, I went to India to learn yoga and then I was exposed to Ayurveda, became very interested in it. And then I came back to Singapore, I took up some courses on Ayurveda. And back in, in 2009, together with my Ayurveda classmates, we started the Ayurveda Association of Singapore. Okay, thanks Vasanti for sharing a bit more about yourself. So as you know, we live in a multicultural Singapore and it's inevitable that we do find there are similarities and differences with other types of traditional medicine that can be found in Singapore. So today, we also have the privilege of having uh, Mei Yi, okay, who is a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner and she will be able to share with us a bit more about uh, the similarities and differences between uh, TCN and Ayurveda. So uh, maybe Mei Yi, could you introduce yourself to the viewers as Thank well? Thank you, Fabian. Hi everyone, I'm Mei Yi from Taishan Medical Hall, Singapore. Um, the Taishan was started by my grandfather in 1955, 65 years ago. Um, and we are family owned and family run. I'm the current third generation involved in the business. So um, many people often ask me why I entered this uh, uh, profession. And um, I, I would share about my very fond memories about visiting my grandfather in the medical hall where he would be surrounded by these huge wooden drawers. Um, I, would, I, I loved opening them. Uh, he also had a lot of equipment. He had mortars and pestles. He had slicers, grinders, and the very traditional weighing scales. Um, and he was surrounded by jars, glass jars of different shapes and sizes. And I think these memories really stayed with me. Um, and what was really key was that he would, uh, before the inevitable question of asking me what, whether I was studying hard enough, um, he would then uh, give me longan, dried longan and wolfberries to eat as snacks. And um, I think it was very remarkable when most of my classmates were actually eating those very uh, like fried snacks. Yeah, so I think um, it, it has stayed with me. And therefore, after um, completing my university degree, um, I went to do a course uh, in traditional Chinese medicine pharmacy, that was a diploma. Um, and right now, um, I get involved in the business every day, coming into contact with more than 1,000 over different herbal products. So they could be um, 600 different kinds of raw herbs, it could be oils, it could be balms, it could be soups, teas, supplements, um, Chinese medicines. And I think it's very fascinating that kind of um, scope and of course, I'm very happy today to be able to try Vasanti's um, culinary specialties. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mei, for introducing uh, yourself. So uh, right now, we will get, find out a bit more about what Ayurveda is about. So uh, Vasanti, maybe you could just first share with us uh, a bit more what 
Ayurveda is about? Ayurveda, it comes from a two Sanskrit word, Ayu and Veda. Ayu means life, Veda means knowledge. So it's actually a knowledge of life itself and not just medicine. So from the time you are born till the end of your life, everything that we do, Ayurveda covers. So it's food, it's medicine, it's herb, it's environment, everything. Many people think Ayurveda is uh, just treatment. Treatment, yes, it is. However, the main key or the main purpose of Ayurveda is prevention of disease and promotion of health. And this they do through diet and lifestyle. And if you look at uh, food, there is a saying in Ayurveda, food is medicine, medicine is food. And Ayurveda is also something we call universal. Yes, it started in India 5,000 years ago. But it's universal and applicable in current time because you look at the season. So if it's a cold environment, you need something warm. So warm spices complement during cold environment. So you modify it. In Singapore, for example, it's hot throughout. Then certain uh, food is not recommended during hot season. So that is how they say you modify it according to your season, according to your what we call prakriti, your, your natural type of the body. Thanks Ms. Santi for sharing uh, what Ayurveda is about. So maybe you could also share now a bit how uh, certain deeper value practices uh, influence or have uh, associated with Ayurveda. Well, that's a very interesting question because as a kid, young kid, like I said, we don't come from a family of Ayurveda physician but we used to do certain practice. Now when I started learning Ayurveda, I realized where it originated from. So on the day of Deepavali, we will do what they call oiling and the body. And when I started learning Ayurveda, we realized oiling is done to keep the body anxious. Deepavali traditionally in India falls during winter season. So when the body gets dry, we need to keep it anxious. And when you look at the nervous system, it, it needs that anxiousness. So when we use the oil on the body, the oil, uh, they're all herbal. They get into the bloodstream and they nourish the whole body and they keep the anxiousness, the oiliness of that body. Then we will put oil on our head as well. And the oil, we use coconut oil. And now everyone is talking about coconut oil. Coconut oil actually is um, very good in the sense that it is what they call quality is heaviness. So the heaviness keeps the hair in its root. So the hair doesn't fall easily. That's where the coconut oil comes in. Even though it has a lot of medicinal properties as well. And there's also another herb called shikakai which the Indians will use either for the hair, it's very good uh, to prevent dandruff, to prevent early graying of the hair. And as kids, we didn't know all this, we just do it as a routine. But when I started studying Ayurveda, I realized actually there is a reason behind doing all this. It may look like a ritual, but actually there is a medicinal or a health reason associated with it. So, um, Li, is there anything similar in TCM? Like yeah, we actually have a herb called He Shou Wu which um, also uh, prevents premature graying of the hair um, and also the, peop uh, the people who want to uh, improve on the condition of the hair, they will use Hershou Wu. And I think what you mentioned is very interesting. Um, in traditional Chinese medicine, uh, the kidney is directly linked to hair. Yeah. So um, a lot of herbs that we'll use to improve the condition of hair will actually, first of all, help the kidneys. And the other very interesting part of it is that it's, they tend to be very dark coloured. So dark coloured herbs tend to be very good for the kidneys. Yeah, so I think in the past, uh, for the Chinese, that was how they correlated what they saw in nature to the function of the herbs. So Amy, so, um, as you listen to Vasanti, she also mentioned about oiling, right? So are there any commonalities or differences in TCM when it comes to oil? Mm. Is oil used as well? Yeah. Um, Actually, Singapore has a very special reputation for oils. Um, we don't really have massage oils um, from the traditional Chinese perspective, but we have a lot of functional oils. So for example, um, you will see that this is nutmeg oil. So nutmeg is actually widely used in TCM um, to help prevent flatulence. Or if there's flatulence, um, it actually warms up the body and warms up the stomach in particular to help to get rid of the flatulence. Yeah. Um, this is an example of how spice is actually used inside uh, herbal oil. Um, this one, very interesting. Uh, this is called Hei Gui Yo, Hat Kwai Oil. Um, and this actually utilises more than 10 over different spices. 
So, uh, like for example, cinnamon or fennel, cardamom. Um, because in TCM, herbs, uh, spices are excellent for improving circulation. Um, and they provide a lot of warmth uh, to the bodies. So, uh, Vasanti, so do you notice any uh, similarities with what uh, May mentioned? Like, because she just mentioned that fennel and cardamom is also used in the oils, in Chinese uh, uh, TCM oil. How about in um, Ayurveda? Yes, yes, we do a lot of it. And a lot of them are taken internally, orally as well. Fennel is a cooling herb. And uh, so we have what you call the heaty body type and the cooling body type. And when a person has a lot of heat in the body, you use fennel seed. And cardamom is also used in the cooking and all of them have medicinal property. So it's more of balancing the heat and the cold. And that's how you use all the herbs for balancing that uh, properties in the food. Uh, so Vasanti, going back to Deeper Valley, maybe could you share with, with us a bit more of what other practices uh, that you do during Deeper Valley? Oh, okay. I remember we clean the house all the time, right? So spring cleaning is usually part and parcel of um, Deeper Valley. So we, it's more like a new beginning, right? So it's not that only once a year we clean the house, just that a new beginning is very symbolic. Then after our oiling, the shower and all those, we have new clothes. And the new clothes, interestingly, will be in the prayer room. So we take it from the prayer room, we then um, you know, go to the bathroom, have shower and then wear the new clothes. After that, we go to the prayer room and we get blessing from the elders. So parents will fall at their feet, get their blessings and then we will eat you know, a food that we have served to the ancestors. Oh, that's very similar, right? Uh, for the Chinese, yeah. So we also uh, try to wear new clothes uh, and then at the same time, we'll pay our respects to our elders and then get their blessings. So now we move on to food, which is I know something that's very close to many Singaporeans' heart. Yeah, Santi will be able to share with us how certain spices are present in these uh, dishes and the Ayurveda principles behind them as well. So maybe Vasanti, could you share with us uh, the first dish? I believe it should be brani, sure. the very delicious looking one. <laughs> As you can see, the biryani is something that's commonly served in Deepavali. Again, like I said, because we are third generation uh, Singaporean, we do cook just like what it was in India, but then there's the modification as well. Now, when you look at biryani, this is called a heavy dish. So Ayurveda look at food in terms of qualities, the heaviness, the lightness, the sharpness, these are what it looks at. So the food being heavy to digest, the spices they will use is something that can kindle the digestion will help with the digestion. So they use pepper. Pepper is something that's considered hot, hot and sharp. So it stimulates digestion, it helps with the digestion of uh, biryani and chicken is also heavy on the digestion. Then ginger is another one that's um, known as an excellent herb because it uh, there's, a, uh, there's a phrase called deepana and pachana. That means it either kindles your digestive fire or even eats up what we call toxin. Toxins are known as ama. If food is undigested, it then circulates in the bloodstream and clogs the blood. And there is a saying in, in uh, Ayurveda that the body is made up of food. So we are food. So for the food to be transformed into body parts, everything has to be clear and digestion is the key to health according to Ayurveda. So we also add garlic. Now garlic, um, Ayurveda looks at food in terms of taste and property. So taste, we have six tastes and properties is heating and cooling. And garlic is seen as one of the rejuvenative herb. Interestingly, when you look at the current research, it says garlic is very good for the heart. Yes, it is very good for the heart and the Indians use this a lot in the cooking. But again, we also take so many factors into consideration that's the heaty type. If, if I have too much of heat in my body, then I have to be mindful about taking too much of garlic. So it's always a balance. And if the weather is hot, then again, be mindful. I can take garlic, but then be very careful that the heat doesn't go aggravated or doesn't get too much. So otherwise, in balance, all these herbs are excellent for digesting the food. A lot of the spices that uh, Vasanti mentioned, and um, I actually brought uh, 19 herbs here, which are part of a very special recipe called pakote. Um, in Chinese, we call it rou gu cha. Um, it actually means uh, rou is meat, uh, gu is bones, and cha is uh, tea. And so, rou gu cha is something that uh, the Chinese take a lot of, especially in Singapore and in Malaysia. Um, and this entire concoction of herbs is meant to strengthen the body, okay, 
Um, at the same time, it warms up the body because of the prevalence of so many different spices. And at the same time, it gives vitality to the body. Um, and so I wanted to um, bring special attention to the kinds of herbs that we put inside this soup. So there, um, for example, there's cinnamon, um, there's fennel, this is citron pepper, uh, there is nutmeg, this is black cardamom, we also have um, star anise uh, and pepper. So these are some herbs that are used within this soup to help with circulation and to warm up the body. Now, turmeric, as you can see, is one of the most uh, treasured spice of Indians. It's known as the golden spice. And it adds colour, many people think, but actually it's antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, anti-inflammatory. I mean, it has research has shown that it's got so much of medicinal property. And the main reason for using it is for medicinal property. So when we are using it for a cooking, like this, say for biryani for eight people, you would just use one teaspoon of turmeric. That's when we say um, medicine is food, or food is medicine. But when you want to use it for a healing property, a person has fever, then we will use the same one teaspoon. Say if you have sore throat, then you will use one teaspoon for maybe four, te uh, four tablespoons of honey, mix it and use it, it becomes more medicine. So this is where food is medicine, medicine is food. For normal cooking, you will just use one teaspoon. But again, everything in Ayurveda is balanced because turmeric is also heaty. Too much can, there's a saying in Tamil, anything taken too much can become poison. So, uh, me, do you see any other similarities? Or? Yeah, we use a lot of, uh, we use a lot of ginger as well. Um, I think ginger is used very, um, like, daily, right, in our cooking. Um, however, in uh, a medical hall context uh, for TCM, we actually distinguish between fresh ginger and ginger that has been dried up and sliced up for easy dispensing in a medical hall. So um, I brought this to show you. This is a uh, dried ginger. Um, it's a lot more concentrated um, and therefore it's used in prescriptions actually to warm up the body um, and also to specifically for people who are feeling very cold all the time. So their limbs are very cold. Um, and so there is a saying in TCM, uh, fresh ginger has very fast effect. It flows through the body very fast, but it leaves the body. Um, but dried ginger um, flows through the body, not as rapidly, but its effects stay within the body. Yeah. So um, this is also, uh, so uh, fresh ginger is also used widely by people uh, who vomit, like if they feel nauseous, vomit, or even um, like for confinement. So uh, we have this one month confinement, right? Where uh, up, up, it's called a postnatal month, where after giving birth, we'll actually have a lot of different dishes that have fresh ginger. Yeah, but um, this one is used more in prescriptions, um, dispensed in a medical hall. So thank you Vasanti and May for sharing with us such deep insights into how these spices are viewed through a TCM as well as an Ayurvedic lens. So it's interesting to see that there are actually common commonalities between the spices that are used to make uh, brani as well as bakute. So for example, uh, pepper as well as ginger are essential spices in the making of these two dishes. But yet, there are also differences that make each dish uh, unique in their own ways. So for example, uh, turmeric is very much used to make brani. So it's interesting to see that for bakute, star anise is used as a unique item in the creation of this dish. So. But what is truly amazing is that I think for both uh, TCM as well as Ayurveda, I think ginger is common, commonly used in the creation of brani as well as bakute, but it also aids in digestion. So I think it's interesting to see that there is such commonalities. If you are interested to see beautiful watercolour paintings of these spices that we just talked about from the National Museum, you can view them in our William Parker collection of natural history drawings. You can click on the links in the video description below to view these beautiful watercolour paintings. Uh, so uh, Vasanti, maybe you can share with us another dish uh, that is uh, usually consumed during Deepa Valley in Singapore? Sure. So this dish you look at here, it's a pongal. It's a rice and milk with cashew nut and raisins. Now it's very rich, you can see. As I mentioned, pongal is a sweet dish and a sweet, sour, salty is nourishing for the body. 
Even though it's heavy on the digestion, Ayurveda always makes it clear you need to take care of your digestion. If your person's digestion is at the peak, you will be able to digest anything. Sometimes people may ask, how come, you know, in India, maybe they don't use really, they don't eat pungal for Deepavali. But we need to understand that my family, we are three generations Singaporean. My, my, my grandmother used to wear baju kabaya. And that's how I saw them. So there's a lot of modification. And pongal is a nice uh, heavy food, but the weather in Singapore is always hot. So we always look at seasons, that you know, the season is always um, balancing with what we eat. So hot season and a very nourishing food as a good balance there. So me, shall I invite you to try this delicious yeah. dish called pongal? Yes. Mm, it's very yummy. Cashew nuts and raisins yes, as well. Yes. Raisins, cashew nut, mm. rice, so rice pudding. I love it. Please leave everything for me. <laughs> okay, so now let us turn our attention to snacks, okay, that are eaten during Deepa Valley. So today I believe uh, we have two snacks that are commonly eaten during Deepa Valley. So we have uh, muruku, which is over here, and we also have a uh, besan ball over there. So uh, maybe Vasanti, could you share with us a bit more first about um, muruku? Okay, again, muruku is a very um, favorite dish among a lot of people, Chinese, Malay, Indians, everyone like it. And as a young kid, we used to just eat it. But when I started learning Ayurveda, I realized that muruka is made from basin flour, chickpea flour. So Ayurveda sees uh, chickpea as something heavy to digest. Anything that is heavy to digest, you need to add spices that will aid, will help with the digestion. So if you look at it, it has what you call cumin seed. Cumin seed is more heaty and it adds on with the digestion. It helps a person with the digestion. So enjoy your muruka. <laughs> it's heavy to digest, but don't worry, there's always that little cumin seed that will help with the digestion. So this one is called Nei Urande. And the way the Ayurveda sees it is, anything that is heavy to digest, you need to add something to help with the digestion. So it's made with ghee, and ghee is considered as something that stimulates digestion. So it's very interesting that something, you know, it's, it's Deepavali is a time for you to enjoy, be with loved ones, have all the food, but also they add all these um, ingredients, the spices, the, the type of all the herbs, to make sure that there is a balance. So a big thank you to Vasanti and me for being part of today's program. So I hope all of you also learn a bit more about the similarities and differences uh, between Ayurveda and TCM. So thank you for being a part of this program presented by the National Museum of Singapore. Please hit the subscribe button below if you really enjoyed this video. And you can also follow us on our National Museum of Singapore Facebook or our Instagram page if you'd like to be kept up to date with our latest programs. So from all of us here at the National Museum of Singapore, we would like to wish everyone Deepavali Valtica! Deepa